let's get started. Um, so the last thing that we talked about was about plasticity. And uh, we, we are done with plasticity. Uh, now we're going to start talking about uh, hydraulic fracturing, OK? Uh, so done with plasticity. Uh, let's go into open mode fractures. Uh, let me hide this. All right. Okay, first of all, what is going to be the dominant mode in hydraulic fracturing? The dominant failure mode. So remember that we were able to to draw this uh, yield surface uh, that can be uh, I, I don't know oh I know why that is like that but uh, we, we can move that if you want uh, okay so so this this was the last thing that we saw that we had a yield surface I want we're going to limit ourselves just to shear and uh, tensile uh, failure so if our conditions in C2 we have a let's say a minimum principal stress and a maximum effective principal stress we know that if we go into that direction you're going to run into shear and usually when you run into shear there is one stress which is much larger than the other and most times you will have those two to be uh, compressive stresses and your failure surfaces especially if you have strain softening are going to look something like this right uh, but uh, if you go in this direction your more circle can get into tensile failure and if now this is your sigma 3 and this is your sigma 1 for that particular circle the model failure is going to be different so let's say that we are pulling into this direction and there is a small compression into this direction as we see in the more circle we'll expect a tensile or an open mode fracture to be perpendicular to the minimum principal stress right so uh, nothing new or to what we have uh, already discussed before so but what I would like to do now is to apply this concept to to the wellbore and we're going to see later on that these two modes are important in hydraulic fracturing the tensile and the shear uh, but but that's going to be uh, further uh, uh, down the road so let's not talk about that right now we're just going to see what happens when you have tensile failure in the wellbore so let's make a schematic of a vertical wellbore and in that vertical wellbore we have a cylindrical uh, cavity uh, like this one uh, which is subjected to principal stresses SV uh, let's say SH max uh, perpendicular to that SH mean uh, I would like to compute stresses at the wall of the wellbore and I'd like to know where I can have tensile failure I think you already know the answer for that right in which point am I going to have tensile failure around the wellbore so this is just a half section here number one number two number three according to this schematic and let's so this is something that you did in your in your project right that where you were looking for tensile failures you were not looking at the position of tensile failure but it was more to say whether there was or not tensile failure uh, but in this case uh, your tensile failure is going to be here there and there and that that may go through the section 
and uh, it's going to form a, a, a fracture right here. So uh, let's use the Kirsch equation uh, in order to uh, calculate uh, what is the pressure that we need in order to cause that uh, tensile failure. You also work with this Kirsch equation. Uh, I didn't write down that before in detail, but if you go to the notes, you'll see that the hoop stress at the wall of the wellbore it's this equation. Uh, let me let me write this well. I don't like this. First of all, we have the effective stress radial support, the pressure in the wellbore minus the pore pressure. Then we have the contribution of stress anisotropy or the mean stress in this case. Uh, remember those sigmas are effective stresses and, and now we have the contribution of stress and isotropy and this one depends on the angle at which you measure that stress where theta if this is the center it's going to be the angle from the maximum principal stress uh, from that line till the point at which you can compute uh, you want to compute that stress so at that point this is where you compute your sigma theta theta remember that in our case uh, we are just computing that stress at the wall of the wellbore okay so the whole idea here is uh, just to find the conditions for which we're going to have tensile failure. Uh, these hydraulic fractures are always going to start with a tension somewhere in the rock. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we're going to set this theta at, e at zero. So that's gonna be this point. And at 180 degrees, which is going to be that point over there. And also, uh, I'm going to say that the hoop stress is going to be negative so it's going to be a tension and its uh, absolute value is going to be equal to the tensile strength of the rock so this point over here that point over there that's the tensile strength there are some rocks that have very large tensile strength uh, up to 10 MPAs or, or, or a little bit more which, which is quite a bit and some other rocks that have zero tensile strength so it varies a lot but most rocks they have a small tensile uh, strength alright so uh, so now everything you have to do here is just replace this sigma theta theta for uh, negative tensile strength uh, what is going to be the cosine of zero is going to be one right so I replace that and if this is equal to one then notice that uh, over here this is going to be negative sigma h max and two negative and one positive it's gonna be one negative and I have two positives and one positive is gonna be three positive sigma h mean and from here I can compute what is the going to be the pressure in the wellbore that causes that uh, stress to reach the tensile strength of the rock and I'm going to call that one PV or breakdown pressure and I'm going to explain why that's called breakdown pressure in a bit so the breakdown pressure I move this one to the left it's gonna be pore pressure plus, uh, let me write tensile strength at the end minus sigma h max plus 3 sigma h mean plus ts this is the equation of breakdown pressure so um, 
if you were to apply a pressure in the wellbore uh, equal to that magnitude, then you you will have tensile failure. It makes a lot of sense that that pressure has to be larger than the pore pressure, and the bigger the tensile strength, uh, the larger the breakdown pressure is going to be. Imagine like this as pressurizing a pipe. The stronger the pipe material, the higher the pressure that you can put in there. But in these geological formations, we have more components. This is not just like a single pipe. We have this other component, which is a component of stress anisotropy. And uh, th this is something very interesting because uh, depending on the stress anisotropy, uh, your breakdown pressure is going to be different. Let's imagine a case in which the two horizontal stresses are the same. So if uh, sigma h max is equal to sigma h min and just equal to, let's say, sigma h, then pv is going to be pp plus 2 sigma h plus ts, right? So in addition to the pore pressure, in addition to the tensile strength of the rock, you have to overcome another uh, value which also depends on the uh, horizontal stress. Let, let me break down this a little bit further. I'm gonna put one sigma h here and another sigma h here, that's two sigma h plus ts. What is this? That's, that's the, the minimum uh, total stress. Mm -hmm. And that's the pressure that for sure you will have to overcome if you want to do a hydraulic fracture, right? But look, next to the wellbore, in addition to that, you need to go above the tensile strength and you need to go another magnitude, which is sigma h2. This is what is called stress cage. Near the wellbore, uh, depending on the value of the stress and isotropy, you may have to overcome an additional compressive stress due to the loading of compression around the wellbore. And that's because we have a wellbore uh, and uh, that wellbore concentrate compression around it. And uh, because of that, the breakdown pressure is not only higher than the minimum principal stress, but it also needs to overcome tensile strength and an additional value of effective stress uh, proportional to that effective horizontal stress. Yes. Uh, so sigma h max and sigma h min are the same. Doesn't your anisotropy factor from Kirchhoff's equation cancel out? Or it's uh, so there is there is no anisotropy. It's just an isotropic case. Uh, so, but but still, still you you need this stress. You have this stress cage effect. Uh, that in order to get out of the wellbore, you need to overcome this, these two. Let's see another very interesting case. Uh, do you remember that for strike slip, and uh, I am going to assume limit equilibrium, hopefully you remember that, uh, what is going to be the value of sigma h max as a function of the value of sigma h min? for a typical friction coefficient or, or friction angle equal to 30 degrees. And I assume that the horizontal stress uh, it's uh, causing failure and it just, that's just being supported by the uh, minimum principal horizontal stress. So limit equilibrium, remember, assumes that you have shear failure and then your maximum principal stress depends on the minimum principal stress through which coefficient? You remember that? It depends on the friction angle and it depends on this coefficient Q where Q is sine 1 plus sine of friction angle divided by 1 minus sine of friction angle. 
This is the same of what in geotech is called uh, active uh, active loading. I don't remember very well. Uh, active air pressure. Active active air, air pressure, right? Uh, so so and if I if I say this is in a strike slip, then what is going to be the relation between sigma h mass and sigma h min? Sigma h max is going to be equal to, and let's say friction angle is equal to 30 degrees. How many times sigma h min? Remember this number because it's very useful. Three times sigma h min. And if this is the case, what is going to be PV now in that case of? Uh, lots of stress and isotropy. Actually, this is kind of the maximum stress and isotropy you could get in this place uh, because of uh, the stress in horizontal directions are very different. The larger the stress and isotropy, the more likely it's going to be than the world where you have tensile fractures and, uh, and shear fractures as well. So that now PV It's going to be PP plus TS, right? And actually now, uh, due to this condition, that this condition is going to be even lower than, than before. And uh, l let me modify this a little bit to make it look in things that are more physically meaningful. Again, this is going to be, in this case, SH mean. Uh, so actually, uh, yeah, I can do that. And, and notice that now, uh, if I don't have any tensile strength, uh, that breakdown pressure is going to be even lower than the minimum principal stress. So I'm going to reach the limit of tensile failure at a value uh, lower than the minimum principal stress. Uh, so because of this uh, stress and isotropy around the wellbore, it's easier to propagate these fractures uh, as you start uh, from the wellbore. So let's try to take a look at this case a little bit more in detail, okay? Because that's going to explain something which is called the leak of test, which is usually done uh, to measure minimum principal uh, stress. So, again, I'm going to write it here on top. I'm going to assume that in this case I have a significant stress gauge. And I'm going to run a test in which I make a wellbore. And then I, you may cement that wellbore. And then you put a plug here. And you inject fluids in this cavity. And let's assume in this case uh, we have very little leak off. Either because there is a, a mud cake or because there is uh, very low permeability in the formation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to impose an injection schedule. So this is going to be time and this is going to be injection rate. And I'm going to set this injection rate uh, at the beginning to be equal to zero. Then it goes into the final value, constant for some time zero again and constant again and zero again okay so now what I'm interested in finding is what is going to be the value of the pressure in the wellbore or I can also call this 
the bottom hole pressure, the pressure inside here. Let, let's start making some assumptions. Uh, I'm gonna say that the pore pressure is somewhere over here and I start with the pressure in the well board, which is a little bit higher than that, somewhere around here, okay? If I'm not injecting anything, would you expect the pressure to change? Not very likely, right? Uh, so this, this is the initial pressure. This is PW. Uh, okay, so now I start injecting at a constant rate. And remember that here there is a plug, okay? This is a plug, so nothing is gonna uh, come out uh, from from here, I just inject. And I, I could also assume that here also I have a a uh, where would the ball be? An anti-return uh, valve, so so nothing can return back to the surface. All right. So if I start injecting, what's going to happen with the pressure? It's going to increase, right? Uh, how? How fast is it going to increase? It depends on the compressibility of the fluid and the compressibility of the formation. Uh, but I'm, I'm just making something up here, so I'm going to assume that it, it goes, uh, it, it just increases at some rate. But remember that rate depends on that compressibility. Is it going to increase forever? Can we pressurize the, that to an infinite value? No, right? What is going to be the maximum value? Uh, whatever the flow, the flow and what, what is that? That's a breakdown pressure, right? Is that the question that we have uh, over here? So notice that the breakdown pressure uh, it's equal to, it tells you that it's a pore pressure plus two times the effective horizontal stress plus the tensile strength. So let's, let's just throw that in here. I'm going to assume that here I have, uh, say, one sigma H, two sigma H, and one tensile strength, okay? So from here to here, this is one sigma H, two sigma H, tensile strength. So according to that equation, uh, you're going to uh, reach a, a maximum value which is not going to go higher than this. And you, when you get to this point, now the pressure is going to reach a peak. Okay, so we're at the peak. What happens after? Pressure stabilizes, goes constant, or goes down, wh wh what do you think? Constant? Yeah. Mm, why would it go down, Michael? Because there's, I mean, there's no way you perfectly sealed everything. There might be cracks and stuff that, well, it wasn't able to escape fast enough to depressurize. Uh, okay. In at a relatively high rate. Some of it is gonna flow away from the pump. Let's assume for a minute that we have a negligible leak off. Uh, j just for now, well, you say it's correct, okay? But 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 just you know to make a point, let's assume there is no leak off. What is going to happen with the pressure? It's going to. Is what what why would it go down, Hamza? Um, because as the pressure extends, you get away from the stress gauge. Yeah, we we talked about this stress gauge, right? It it's uh, in order to get up to here then at that point you start propagating some fractures. If those fractures have fluid inside and uh, you run in what is uh, called uh, uncontrolled fracture propagation, usually the velocity of your fractures is going to be very quick. Uh, and it's gonna be also usually uh, quicker. The, the volume that you make by opening a fracture as it propagates is gonna be quicker than the amount of fluid you're injecting. So because there is a mismatch between that, 
new volume created and the amount that you inject, pressure is going to go down. And OK, it will go down. At this point, the fracture is propagating. Now the question is, how far is it going to go down? So what do you think? So let, we assume that it goes down, OK? because the fracture is faster than, than the fluid. Uh, now the question is how much it goes down. What would be the absolute value, the absolute lower bound for this uh, pressure to, uh, to be if we have a propagating fracture? So somewhere around here, uh, we have a fracture which is opening and it's propagating and fluid is flowing inside. What will be the absolute minimum value? Minimum principal the minimum principal stress, right? And this value as we can see from this plot is the pore pressure minus uh, plus the effective stress. So it's going to be this value over here. This is the minimum principal stress. Okay, it cannot go beyond that value. I, I, I know that, but will it go to that or will it be a little bit higher? Why? Why will it be a little bit higher? I, Robert. I would expect the bottom it would bottom out at being PS plus PP if you're in isotropic conditions. Mm, yeah, but uh, let, let's uh, let's not get into anisotropy now. Why would it be the pressure in the well bore higher than than the minimum principal stress? So yes, we're going to see that the opening this fracture costs energy, and that energy comes from the pressure of the fluid. And we need, uh, we have several expenses of energy there. We need to open the fracture, that takes some energy. We need to flow fluid through the fracture, that takes energy too. And we need also need to break the rock at the tip of the fracture. That takes energy too, as well. Uh, um, because of that, uh, the pressure is not going to be exactly the minimum principal stress, but it's going to go down, and then it's going to equilibrate at some pressure that we're going to assume for now it is constant. Sometimes it's not it's not constant, but we're going to assume it's constant for now, and. Uh, the difference between the minimum principal st stress and the pressure in which you propagate the fracture, uh, it's called, so this fracture propagation pressure. This is called the net pressure. The pressure in the fracture minus the the minimum principal stress. That's the additional pressure you need in the fracture for that fracture to propagate. If you get to the bare minimum, mm, very likely that's not going to propagate very quickly, uh, nor very fast. It might propagate with time, uh, but, uh, but it's not going to be quick, uh, for sure. So in order to have this one propagating quickly, you need that additional pressure, the net pressure. Uh, all right. so we're propagating the fracture and then we stop the pumps what happens with pressure it will drop many times you will see that this drops very quickly and then it starts into an unsteady uh, decay another question is again how low is it going to go <coughs> if you just you, you close the pumps okay close the pumps here, stop injecting, uh, how low the pressure is going to go. And now let's put the leak off in there. If there is leak off, what would be the absolute minimum value to which the pressure could go? Definition of leak off would be the fluid that you get inside the pore space of the rock because there is a difference between 
the wellbore pressure or the fracture pressure and the pore pressure. So at the limit where there is no leak off, the wellbore or the fracture pressure should be equal to the pore pressure, right? So it's not going to go lower than this. So at that at this point, you will start to see a decay that is going to try to approach the, the pore pressure. And at some point over here, uh, you will also see that, notice that at this point, at that point, at this point, the fracture is open, okay? But when you stop pumping uh, fluid, there's going to be a point in which your fracture, because the pressure is going down now, it, it has propagated, but now it closes. Before it closes, it, and we are assuming here an open hole uh, leak off, you have leak off from the fracture and from the wellbore. And once this fracture is closed, because your pressure is uh, lower than the pressure needed to open, keep the fracture open, you will just have leak off from the wellbore. And at the point at which that fracture closes, that's going to be equal to, how would you call this point? The fracture closure pressure, right? And look, that point is actually the point where it's very close to the minimum principal stress. So if you want to measure the minimum principal stress, which, which is always a very important magnitude to know, uh, this, this is what you do. You run a hydraulic fracture test. Uh, the maximum value, that's not going to be the minimum principal stress. The propagation pressure, that's not going to be the minimum principal stress. Uh, the minimum principal stress will be the pressure at which the fracture closes again. Yes? So, um, so why do we not have leak off before and then we have leak off after? Well, 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 it's, uh, we, you, we had leak off the, the whole time, but I just wanted to make the case uh, a little bit simpler. But we, we have leak off usually the whole time. You were still pumping before, so that was overcoming the leak off faster than it was happening. Oh. All the time here, I'm, I'm, I'm pumping. And there, there, is, there is leak off as you propagate the fracture. Okay. There is leak off, yes. Just there you're pumping so fast that the leak off is negligible too. It depends on the conditions. Depends on the conditions. Uh, if you're running a leak off test and uh, you have drilling mud and you have a, a wall, a, a, a good uh, mud cake, you might have a, a negligible leak off. I'm just confused here because the conditions in the yeah. first part and the, and the second part are different. And I'm, I'm not what's causing the difference? So what 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 um, what, what is the, the part that, that okay, you so cannot I, reconcile with so, it? So okay. The first part is PW is PW. Yes. And then we have an immediate jump because we have another leak off. No, you have an immediate jump because you're pumping. Look at your injection rate. Right. If you have leak off, then it wouldn't jump, it wouldn't increase so fast. It could increase a little bit more, it could increase more slowly, but it would increase too. If, if you, if we, yeah. Yeah, you have to pump faster than leak Correct, off. correct, correct. If you, if you pump faster than the, the fluid can leak into the formation, then uh, you're going to have this bump. And at some point you're going to have a fracture. Uh, and at some point that fracture is going to propagate and, and then you're going to have fracture closure pressure. When you deal with very permeable media and there is a lot of leak off, there is another test which is called the step rate test that I can, uh, I'm, I'm going to add that in my notes but well, we're not going to have the time to discuss over here, okay? But here we're assuming that, that there is a small leak off but there is some leak off uh, or that you're doing this with, uh, say, hydraulic fracturing fluid, but your formation is has a very low permeability. Okay. So with the, my point is that it, the, the the slope, 
the slope at which the pressure decreases and the slope at which the depends on the leak off. Yeah, th they're yes, they're not as scale. For the, they're not necessarily as scale. It depends on what the leak off, leak -off rate is. It depends on what your injection rate is. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have created a fracture. It, it propagated some distance. Uh, it closed. We get a fracture closure pressure from there. Uh, the question now is, what happens if I inject again? How fast and how high? Well, let's answer how high the pressure is going to go. Will it go? Will it come back to the previous peak? No. Why not? See how you're saying no. Because you have a fracture already, right? So there, there is no tensile strength. There is no tensile strength anymore. So very likely, this is going to, if there is some uh, stress cage effect, it's going to have to go outside the stress cage. And then it's going to run again into this, what I'm assuming now, a more or less constant fracture propagation pressure. Uh, as you shut in the pumps, this is going to decrease again uh, until the the fracture uh, closes. So here again, now you are propagating the fracture even more. Okay, so um, let's talk about the the mechanisms that uh, or the, the orientation of the expected hydraulic fractures. I know we have discussed this already, uh, but, but I like that that we go on one more time on the looking at what would be the orientation of these uh, hydraulic fractures. Uh, so uh, we'll come back to this later on. Uh, trying to solve and to predict all these curves uh, is, is going to to be a problem of which is called the, the coupled hydraulic fracture uh, propagation problem. Before we do that, we need to talk a little bit about the geometry of the fractures and. Uh, about linear uh, elastic fracture mechanics, and then and then once we get that, we'll come back to this problem and try to answer uh, why we have some of these uh, signatures. All right. So let's go to the field and let's make a block diagram in which let's say you are completing a, a formation and as we showed before uh, you have a, uh, a vertical wellbore and this is the pay zone and there is a, a river over here and uh, I'm going to further assume that uh, here you have vertical stress right on the sides, you have maximum horizontal stress and perpendicular to the paper. I have the minimum principal stress and I have a normal faulting regime so that uh, the maximum principal stress is vertical and the minimum is horizontal. The question is, uh, what's going to be the orientation of those hydraulic fractures? It's going to be always a plane uh, perpendicular. Let, let's add some orientation here, coordinate system. Let's say this is the east, this is the north, and this is depth. The hydraulic fracture, if I start a hydraulic fracture over here, is going to be a plane which is perpendicular to this direction, which is going to be in a plane east down, right? So it's going to look something like this. 
let's say, let's make a small hydraulic fracture. So it's going to be a plane perpendicular to that direction. Let's say now that um, you want to create a bigger hydraulic fracture, um, and when you do that, uh, you make a, a horizontal weld. Let me enlarge this so I get a little bit more of space. So now you get to an with another well, a little bit of a step out here, and you put a horizontal wellbore in this case, and you have a cluster with perforations here, there, there, and there. What is going to be the orientation of the fractures? It's going to be still the same, right? The question here is, let's say that, that you start propagating the fractures more or less small like that, and then they grow and intersect each other, and at the end, you're just going to have a hydraulic fracture like this. My question here is, was this any different than, than the vertical wellbore? Do, do I gain much of doing this um, multi-stage uh, hydraulic fracturing with a horizontal wellbore without orientation? Not very likely, right? The objective of multi-stage hydraulic fracturing is that you maximize the surface area of the hydraulic fracturing job. So instead of doing drilling a well in this direction, probably you will be much better off if you put the wellbore through here and then that goes into a lateral section uh, and you make perforations and uh, you put clusters around that horizontal wellbore. What is going to be the orientation of those fractures now? It's going to be the same and but now this is going to form a more complex three-dimensional structure. Right? The whole objective here of this multi-stage hydraulic fracturing uh, it's to increase the surface area of the wellbore in contact with the formation. It's like a tree, right? With a tree, you have a lot of leaves because the leaves uh, take more uh, oxygen, light uh, a, uh, from the atmosphere, from the sun. And uh, the more leaves you have, and that's why also, you know, they are the 2D surface because they can take uh, more energy and oxygen from there. And the hydraulic fractures are the same. You're just trying to increase uh, the, the surface area. So the case uh, that we did over here, uh, this vertical wellbore, you, now we apply what we did before with the the vertical wellbore it looks looks like this, right? So uh, let's imagine that this is in an uncased uh, propagation, and uh, the tensile fractures will start here, right? You agree with me? Those those are these ones. They start at this location, and. Uh, if you keep on increasing the pressure, we'll, we'll have a longer fracture, and this is going to grow like this. I'm assuming here that I have a limit on the on the height. I'm going to discuss that further on. But it will grow into a plane like that, right? Started as a tensile fracture on the wall of the wellbore, it grows out of it, and it goes into the far field. What about the horizontal wellbore that we did over here. Let's imagine for a moment too that that's uncased. Uh, where would you expect to have the tensile fractures in this horizontal wellbore? 
it's not it's not the same as as before okay so let, let me color this this was a tensile fracture original tensile fracture around the wellbore because of the stress and isotropy well in this well where from radials, right? mm. look look at your sh mean so it's going to be we, we need to replicate uh, that right but the, the question is where I'm going to have the tensile fractures in the well bore. Wh what, what is the stress and isotropy perpendicular to this well bore? So we said that SV was higher than SH mean, right? These are the stresses per perpendicular to the, to the direction of the well bore. This is the same as the case that we had before. Tensile fractures are always in the direction of the maximum stress in the plane perpendicular to the wellbore. So in this case, uh, this is the maximum, SV, and those tensile fractures are going to be here. If you continue pressurizing this uncased wellbore, in this case, your hydraulic fractures are going to grow starting from those planes, but they're going to grow larger in the same plane. Because this plane and that plane, they are both perpendicular to SH mean. Do, do you follow me with that? Because now it's going to change the story, okay? So, let's look now at this well we're over here. So now I have a uh, a wellbore. which is coming in this direction. Uh, where do you think the tensile fractures are going to start in this case? I'm, I'm not I'm not going to draw this plane, okay? You you will have to imagine it. But what are the stresses perpendicular to the direction of that plane? We're going to have. SV and SH max, right? Which one is higher? SV is higher. So we'll expect these tensile fractures to be like that. They start here and there, right? And, and not only that, but, but look, the hoop stress, uh, because we're causing a, 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 we're having a wellbore here, you could lower the hoop stress to a point that that hoop stress is even lower than this minimum principal stress. If that hoop stress gets to be lower than the, than the minimum principal stress, you will have a local stress rotation at that point. So at that point, in theory, you would start these tensile fractures out of the wellbore that look something like this, perpendicular to the hoop stress right uh, but that's just close to the wellbore far away from the wellbore still in this direction you have sh mean so if close to the wellbore you have a minimum principal stress in in this direction but far from the wellbore you have stress in that direction what do you think is going to happen It's very difficult to make this drawing, okay? So let me see if I, I succeed. Uh, you're gonna have something which is something like that, where you're gonna have a rotation of the of this hydraulic fracture plane. It starts like this at this point, but as you go further away from the wellbore, it rotates. It rotates and goes into that plane. So do you think this is good for for if you want to make hydraulic fractures? So let me try to draw this other ver other part. It's 
and to rotate like that. Okay, so I hear suggestion. Is it good or is this, is this good or bad? Would you be happy with such a hydraulic fracture? No. Why not? Because there is a <laughs> restriction after that. There, there is a restriction right here, and uh, and why 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 is that uh, bad? Uh, uh, why do we do not want a restriction? The propane will get stuck, right? So this tortuosity is, 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 is not going to be good. It's not going to be good. You, you want to avoid this. Because um, if your objective is to make hydraulic fractures and those hydraulic fractures to go far and to get very nicely propped, uh, this, this is not going to be good. Uh, if your objective is drilling and uh, you want to enlarge the really mud window and have uh, go to higher pressure in the wellbore, uh, probably this is not going to be bad because uh, you can increase the the wellbore pressure and see your hydraulic fracture is not going to propagate very quickly, and uh, and you could go through regions that uh, in which you can use a very high pressure and it's still going to be more or less fine. So, but for hydraulic fractures. For this objective, this is not going to be good. Okay, so what do you do in order to avoid this? What? Operation. You make perforations, right? So you make perforations, and now out of of this uh, region, uh, you can get closer to the far field. Notice that this perforation is also similar in geometry to that vertical wellbore. So once you start the hydraulic fracture from here it's just going to grow in the way that you expected it will go and it's similar to to this case over here so the the main idea of, of this part is uh, recognizing in which orientation hydraulic fractures will propagate and the importance of this stress cage effect or near wellbore effects because they can cause uh, some of those uh, hydraulic fractures to change direction uh, close to the wellbore. Okay, so uh, let, let's continue. What time is it? How much time do we have? 2.53, okay. <coughs> so let's continue talking about uh, ideal hydraulic fractures and let's talk about this. So. I'm assuming in this case that the fracture nicely stops in the pay zone and it doesn't go uh, above, it doesn't go below that. Uh, let's see what are the reasons or for uh, doing something like this. Let's say that I have a section of this reservoir, okay? this one and now here I have the reservoir rock and here I have the cap rock and here I have the bedrock once I met astrophysicist it was called Nigel bedrock it's a funny name for a petrophysicist. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm going to, to assume in this case that this cap rock has a high Yam modulus, the reservoir rock has a lower Yam modulus than the cap rock and the bed rock. And I'm going to assume that here in the far field, I have a constant tectonic strain, which you can also uh, express in terms of a, a displacement. Uh, let, let's add some coordinates over here. So this is going to be x, y, and x, y, z should go up, z. 
so this is going to be a displacement x or tectonic strain ex uh, epsilon x okay my question I, and you should know this by now what is going to be the profile here of uh, horizontal stress in direction x so I like to make a plot here of sigma x x as a function of depth you already did you did this I believe in project number one or number two number two I, I guess so where do you, where are you gonna have higher stress in the high stiffness or in the low stiffness formation in the high stiffness, the high stiffness right so your sigma x x is gonna be higher in the high stiffness area than in the low stiffness area why because that's stiffer material and for the same tectonic strain the stress is going to be uh, is going to be lower and the same principle that we discussed here well actually I, I didn't discuss much but I just assumed it is that always these fractures they try to follow uh, the minimum principal stress wherever that is and you know what sometimes when you have a wellbore effects and stress cages they it changes changes its value it changes its orientation but always the hydraulic fracture is going to accommodate to, to that and it's going to look for the path of minimum resistance and similar to to that in this case it's going to be the same uh, why would the hydraulic fracture propagate to this formation that has higher stress if he can choose this other one that has a lower stress so as long as the stress needed to open that fracture is lower in this formation than in the other formation that fracture is going to be contained into into this middle formation when the fracture starts to open up and starts to uh, create uh, additional stress in the formation because because now you have a, a fracture next to it you're opening the rock uh, you may get to a level in which the fracture is going to start to propagate up and down because it has reached that threshold limit okay but but let's, let's not talk about that uh, right now so uh, probably it would have been better if I did it so start small here propagates like this like this and then gets to the top and the bottom and then just propagates in this direction uh, okay so and if just as a reminder the equation for this I'm assuming that sigma xx is the minimum principal stress if you remember that depends if you compute it with elasticity depends on the vertical effective stress and on the tectonic uh, strains sigma h epsilon h mean and epsilon h max yes I was say, isn't the effect of the xx stress not strictly true should it increase with vertical depth yes it should but but here I'm, I'm assuming that this is a short section where I'm, I'm neglecting gravity but yes it, it should increase with uh, with depth in the in the rigorous case so uh, considering these effects of uh, variation of stress with depth is when and now we can define what will be the expected fracture height okay and th this is going to be something very important that uh, we need uh, in in a minute in order to solve or actually next week I guess in order to solve this uh, fracture problem and um, I, I we need to run this lab so I want to make sure that we're closer to the end okay let me do this very quickly uh, here for an ideal hydraulic fracture now then if I look perpendicular to that fracture then this is going to be the fracture 
uh, this is going to be the wellbore. I'm, I'm assuming a, a planar fracture in this case. We just saw that this is going to be the hydraulic fracture height. Uh, this is what we're going to call the uh, fracture uh, half wing uh, distance or length. And if we look at the plane perpendicular to the fracture or perpendicular to the wellbore in this case, we're going to see something that looks more or less like an ellipse in which we have a width that depends on variable x. So, in order to propagate now this fracture, uh, as I was saying uh, before, uh, and this is going to be the couple fracture problem, uh, we're going to need a net pressure, which is a summation of of several pressures. Uh, first of all, uh, this is just net pressure, okay? So I'm not considering the minimum principal stress, just the net pressure. We need some pressure because we need to deform the fracture. That deformation takes some additional pressure. We need another pressure, which is due to the viscous losses. What we need in order to move the fluid from the wellbore through the fracture and also from the fracture through the porous medium. And third, we need an additional pressure in order to create a new rock surface. Basically, to split the rock, okay? We're going to discuss this one and this one uh, in detail uh, next week now because I have all the device here I like to talk about this one okay and this one depends on something which we call fracture toughness when the intensity stress factor of the rock is higher than than the fracture toughness there's going to be propagation. If not, there is no propagation. The question now is, uh, what is, how to measure this fracture toughness? I, I, I hate to, to rush through this, but uh, I'm going to get back to this, okay? To what is a stress intensity factor? Actually, we're going to solve a limit in class, okay? That doesn't that sound like fun to, to you guys? I'm sure that you like math. That's why you're here and uh, solving a limit is going to be fun. But uh, here, what I, I'd like to do with you now is to measure the fracture toughness of a limestone, OK? Uh, I, for that, I have a small dog frame. So can I get help, guys, uh, from some of you? So I can, we can run this test. I need I need many people helping, okay? I need I need one to, to take the readings, I need another one to to apply the load and I need some somebody else to take uh, uh, to take a video okay? So so come on over here. Uh, you, you don't have to take notes right now. Uh, all right, so let me let me pause this video here.